Um, my name is Kelly Huggins. I am a historian and museum professional. I currently work at the Fenimore Art Museum and Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, uh, where I work in communications and social media. Uh, but I have a master's in history and uh, spend uh, my free and professional time working on uh, a variety of projects and many of which deal with New York State history. So I would like to thank David and Skahari Crossing for inviting me to be here tonight to talk to you about one of my research projects, I would say my main one, which is about Railroad Jack, who you are going to hear a lot more about soon. Um, I'm going to break this presentation into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about who Railroad Jack was, because unless you've heard me talk about this before, you probably haven't been introduced to this pretty obscure figure. Though, if I'm wrong, let me know. I would be curious how you knew. Uh, the second part, I'm going to talk about how and why I have become so invested in trying to solve the mystery of what happened to his taxidermied body. And then I'm going to conclude with our third part, talking a little bit about why Jack and other famous dogs, particularly of the late 19th century, matter, which hopefully uh, I won't have to work too hard at that since you volunteered your time to be here tonight. So hopefully you have a little bit of interest at least. But I'll wrap it up with some thoughts about the ways that they um, kind of tie in with the Gilded Age. I'm going to share my screen here. Give me just a second. Now... I've lost the chat, but I'm going to assume everyone can still see this here. Um, and then if anyone wants to reach out to me, I saw David shared my website in the comments. Uh, you can reach out to me from there. I'm also on Instagram and uh, what was formerly Twitter, uh, at Kelly Huggins. And I do have a website that is dedicated to this project called FindingRailroadJack.com. You can find me there as well. And this will be on the final slide, too. So if you didn't catch this, it's, it's coming back. We'll get into our first section. Who was Railroad Jack? Railroad Jack lived a full and eventful life before his death from old age in 1893. He traveled around America and to Mexico and Cuba. He was kidnapped. He was forced into a sideshow. He was stabbed and he was locked into an intense professional rivalry, which is all pretty impressive for a dog. In many ways, Jack and other famous dogs of the era, at least two uh, I will mention also tonight, represented 19th century aspirations with their rags to riches stories of dogs achieving a canine version of the American dream. I know that sounds lofty, but stay with me. Jack's Dickensian origin story began in Albany, New York around 1880. Now, this is not a terribly good image, um, but why I'm sharing this with you is this is actually the first known mention I have found of Railroad Jack in the press. And this illustration accompanies it. Uh, I don't think it is terribly accurate or flattering from <laughs> what we can tell. Um, they do call him a mongrel in the piece. So uh, I think the illustration is trying to get that across. Um, but I bring it here just so you can see a few different representations of him, including the earliest. Now, the details of Jack's early life are difficult to ascertain. At some point, he became the mascot of the baggage room of the Union Depot in Albany and then started riding the trains himself, allegedly showing an innate sense of direction and aptitude and interest in doing so. 
my research has shown a lot more human intervention in this process <laughs> than a lot of the myth uh, sort of assumed. But still, he had to have some desire to get on the trains in the first place. Accounts of his origins and whereabouts in these early years are spotty, and many of the details of the first few years of his life and, and career, we'll call it train riding, are from accounts written retroactively at the end of his life. Not all of them, there's a lot of contemporary source material, but some of the myth-making comes from his obituaries and memorial pieces. For example, biographies of Jack from later in his career claimed he attended the inauguration of President Grover Cleveland on um, March 4th, 1885. Uh, I have not found any actual record mentioning this trip from that period. Uh, so I believe that this is a detail that was added later to give a little bit of color. But you can see the beginnings of how these myths uh, start to develop. In fact, newspapers didn't regularly report on Jack's whereabouts until about 1888. So there's probably a gap of about six to eight years of his early life that we just don't have a good record of. Uh, by that point, though, by 1888, Jack had begun taking longer trips uh, and his reputation spread as local papers um, detailed his arrival in stations in small towns at this point, primarily around New York State but then also starting to um, spread out. Really kind of out is about far west as Chicago. Um, Chicago was a major rail hub during this period, but still kind of in this area mostly. Um, the Brookfield New York Courier at this period commented that Jack had constituted himself the chief railroad inspector of the United States. It also, um, it's also in reports from this time that you start to get some glimpses of um, creation of his backstory. Um, for example, it was a big part of Jack's origin that he is this mutt, that he was a stray, that he came um, into the baggage room with no owner. Um, if you know the story of another famous dog, I'll mention this all sounds very familiar. Um, then you have others arguing that um, Jack belonged to uh, an express driver or somebody. There's There becomes a market essentially for explaining who this dog was and why he mattered during his life as he starts to um, be known in more places. As Jack appeared in more towns and in more local newspapers, the demand for him to make scheduled appearances grew. Um, in 1889, the Albany Kennel Club wanted Jack to attend uh, their annual exhibition, and they had to send out to Binghamton for him because one of the problems with a train riding dog with no set itinerary is they can go pretty much anywhere. Um, especially when they were as enabled by the railroad workers as Railroad Jack was. His increased travels required increased identification. Uh, the railroad men in Albany created his uh, a collar for him that was engraved with his name and home station. Now, this is also pretty important because there was another terrier riding the rails at the same time who was frequently confused for Jack. Um, but also, especially in these early years, he needed to basically come with instructions. Um, toward the end of his life, people in a station, a railroad workers in a station where he hadn't been, would be able to pretty much tell who this was. But it wasn't until his reputation grew that they would know immediately it was Railroad Jack. So he would have a collar that said his name and basically a little blurb about who he was and the instruction to just put him on the next train. 
So these are important signifiers and identification too that go with him. Eventually, Jack's arrival in a town becomes a source of celebration. Newspaper reporters and editors delighted in having Jack come to their offices and photographers clamored for a chance to have him in their studio. Now, this is an ad from Albany's Thomas Ritchie & Co. shoe store, and it's a little hard to see. I apologize, it's not great quality, but uh, basically the shoe store in Albany uh, in the early 1890s created a Railroad Jack branded shoe. And uh, their advertisement claimed, and I can read it since you probably can't get it too good there, Jack can tell by a man's look whether he wears Thomas Ritchie & Co. Hamburg Cordovan cork sole shoes or not. Jack uh, says no matter where he wanders, he will find them. When he sees anyone cold or crippled, he will call out. Now, it's a really interesting example of using a mascot for advertising, using a dog or an animal who doesn't even use the product you're advertising for advertising. In later ads, um, Richie and Co. are even more explicit in marketing to railroad workers who would have known Jack firsthand. Um, and this really uh, heats up after Jack dies, uh, basically saying, oh, you can get the railroad shoes for railroad men to commemorate your lost friend. And there's even a picture of him on the box. So you start to see some kind of crass consumerism develop around him as well. Um, beyond that, entertaining Jack became kind of a competition as people developed special experiences for this distinguished canine guest. On one vacation in Saratoga, for example, Jack was reported to go to the casino and ride a merry-go-round. During an 1890 visit to Elmira, New York, Jack was brought to the county fairgrounds where he had a play date with Colonel who was the St. Bernard mascot of the Elmira Telegram. Um, Colonel is another dog that I have done a lot of work on. Um, I used to work in Elmira at the Historical Society out there, and I've done a couple of articles about uh, Colonel, who was Elmira's most famous dog, which is a funny thing to say that a town has a most famous dog, but it was Colonel. Um, and I just, it's funny to me that there was this um, sort of canine summit where it was this big deal that these two famous dogs came together. But despite Jack's celebrity status, his story also illustrates how dangerous life as a dog in the late 19th century was. Riding on trains proved to be quite treacherous for the little terrier. When Jack was riding in a baggage car in 1890, allegedly a full coffin fell on him and amputated one of his toes. In 1890, he jumped from a moving train that was going 25 miles an hour near Stony Point, New York. In that accident, he badly injured his foot and was sent to a veterinary hospital. 1890 continued to be a rough year for Jack when he was stabbed in the chest during a break-in at Albany's Union Station. He was reported to be near death, but recovered and was back to traveling a couple weeks later. Uh, noting his indomitable spirit, the railroad men used to brag that he would roll over and show his stab wound injury uh, to anybody on command. And then later that year in 1890 in August, Jack again fell from a train when it rounded a corner by Fultonville, just down the road from Scary Crossing, badly bruising and cutting his chest. But again, he uh, was seemingly indestructible and was back on the tracks a month later. So I've alluded to this guy, but in 1890, Jack's chroniclers added an antagonist to his stories in the form of the Postal Service's Oni. 
Now, if you were going to know any famous dogs from the 1890s, you would probably know Oni. Oni is taxidermied and uh, on display at the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. He has been the subject of multiple children's books. Um, still to this day, classrooms do projects where they learn about geography by sending a stuffed Oni around to different places. Um, he is the one who has maintained any kind of cultural relevance. But as we'll, we'll see, um, he was not the first. Now, Oni, also interestingly, from Albany, uh, was portrayed to be the new upstart and the rivalry was dramatized in the press. Oni was said to be jealous of Jack and that the mere mention of Jack's name made Oni howl. So you can see how ridiculous the storytelling around this gets, right? The, the sort of manufactured drama about this canine rivalry. So ironically though, while some newspapers were exploiting this sort of canine bitter feud, um, others really couldn't even tell them apart. Now you've seen pictures of Railroad Jack and I'll have some more for you here and some pictures of Oni and you can understand why. I mean, they were really pretty similar. They were both terrier mutts. They were similar sizes and weights. Um, as far as I can tell, one of the primary ways to tell them apart is their ears. Um, Jack had docked ears, so his stayed up kind of pointy. Um, they have slightly different structures and coloring, but if you were not really familiar with either, um, they could easily be confused. And this is where, when you're trying to track both of them. And my larger project does look at both dogs. It's it's kind of a dual biography. Um, there are instances where I can tell a report names Oni, but is actually talking about Jack or vice versa. And then there are other reports where I genuinely can't tell which dog it is. Because um, they'll name one, but then the dates don't match up to something else I know. Um, there is a fair deal of confusion uh, in the record between them, but I can verify they were distinct, separate dogs, despite that. By 1891, people began to note that Jack, who was around 10 years old at that time, was starting to show the ravages of age. Um, but still, Jack maintained a busy itinerary. Around late August or early September 1891, Jack went missing. Word spread that he had died in Buffalo, and the railroad men began to mourn their loss. However, later that fall, someone sent the Albany Railroad men a newspaper clipping advertising for a slideshow at the Musee Theater I'm just going to get, we have Railroad Jack there, uh, actually from Elmira. I don't know if that was taken while he was visiting Colonel. But here you can see the Musee Theater. Again, not great quality, these images. I apologize. Uh, but you can get a sense of the space. This was the main theater. Jack was most likely displayed in their side theater. Um, but Jack was basically, uh, depending on who you ask, kidnapped and put into display at the Musee Theater, along with, quote, a Chinese Lilliputian, a giantess, and a petrified woman. Uh, so this was your standard dime or freak show. The show had a 10 cent admission and there were four shows a day. The show traveled regionally, uh, no, I know that they had at least one other showing in Rochester that November. The railroad men in Albany were very angry to find that their uh, dog had basically been forced into this sideshow. And they organized uh, across the state, really, to get him back. 
The rough story is uh, a group of railroad men came to the theater and confronted um, Mr. Robinson here, who is, is seen there, who is the proprietor of the theater, and basically demanded him back. Robinson's argument was that Jack had actually come there on his own and wanted to be there, but he did allow them to take him. Um, there was another report basically of Jack going back to visit years later or a, about a year later, because he doesn't have that many years left. Um, so it's a little hard to say what exactly happened in this, but Jack did have some time maybe kidnapped into a sideshow. Jack traveled throughout 1892 um, and 1890 and into 1893, even though he was becoming more decrepit. Um, in the summer of 1892, he traveled more extensively than ever before, going from Maine down the East Coast, then out to California, Mexico, and throughout the West and Midwest. During a stopover in Salt Lake City, Utah, he was laid up for a bit after, quote, one of his propellers was chawed upon by a Mormon dog. When he arrived in Los Angeles, he paid a visit to the Los Angeles Herald office where they inspected him and weighed him, recording him at 53 pounds, which for his size was quite hefty. Um, probably all of the special meals he got when he went um, to any of these stations. They also inventoried 44 individual tags that he had received as gifts at various stops along the way. Um, a big portion of the cultural history of both Jack and Oni were the ways that people liked to give them gifts. When Jack arrived back home in Albany after this trip, he had with him boxes of tokens that he acquired along his trek. Um, Oni was similar, for example. So Oni, if you see him displayed currently, he has um, kind of a, a vest or harness where a lot of his medals are attached. And that's kind of a replica of one that he had during his life. So he would actually be wearing many of these tags in, in a harness. And it was a big deal to put your tag essentially claiming, you know, Railroad Jack or Oni was here and the date. Uh, but Jack, more so than even Oni, um, has records of getting a lot of weird stuff also. Um, when he came back in 1892, there were printed inventories of all of, the, all of the gifts that he carried with him. And among those were unusual items, like a human skull, medicines for cramps, rheumatism, consumption, cholera, dysentery, sunstroke, and kidney troubles a full set of false teeth, and a gigantic female shoe labeled compliments of the Bell of Chicago. Now, I think that uh, part of the reason this trip was so large and that, that people gave Jack so many gifts was because people kind of sensed that this was the last hurrah for him. He was, as I mentioned, starting to decline. So he only made a few regional trips in 1893. Um, before his weight and age took too much of a toll. On June 13th, 1893, at approximately 13 years of age, Jack died in the baggage room of the Union Depot, uh, surrounded by the baggage men who had cared for him for the majority of his life. Newspapers around the country ran mournful obituaries for him. And then the railroad men had him stuffed and put on display, which brings us to our second piece and our central mystery. What happened to Jack's body? In December of 1894, Jack was on display at Saul's clothing store on North Pearl Street in Albany as part of a large taxidermy display. For years, that was the last known location. I tried looking everywhere. <laughs> I tried looking um, for Saul and looking into Saul and what happened to the store. Um, that was a long shot because I knew it was unlikely he had stayed there long term. Um, and I, I looked into all sorts of various places. Then I had a small breakthrough. 
I found a newspaper article from the era that mentioned a location after Saul's. Railroad Jack ended up back at the home of William Vigors, the Albany taxidermist who uh, was responsible for preserving Jack. Um, the article noted that a second floor in Vigors's Albany home was dedicated to his extensive collection of taxidermy. And there Jack sat along birds and other stuffed animals, including a two-headed calf. And at least a portion of Jack's medals and gifts, including the large shoe, were with him at that point. But then Jack disappeared. And unfortunately, I don't mean that he was taken or anything um, sinister like that. And in a lot of ways, I would prefer that because then maybe there would be more of a paper trail. But um, after this record um, from the late 1890s of him being in William Vigors's house, I have no more record of what happened to his body. William Vigors died in 1911 and was survived by five sons and 11 grandchildren. Some of Vigors' sons also worked as taxidermists, so it's possible they inherited the collections, but I've struggled to track down any direct descendants more than a century and a quarter later um, to see if any of the pieces, including Jack, remained in the family as heirlooms. And I will say it's a really weird position to find yourself in, contemplating whether it's appropriate to cold call people and ask them uh, if they might have any historical dog corpses laying around. Um, it hasn't come to that because I just haven't found any really compelling candidates to contact. Um, but it is an interesting uh, question that doesn't come up too often in your daily life. So when it comes to Jack, was he brought to the Union Station for display? Um, the story gets more complicated there. In 1898, the officials of the city of Albany improved the construction of a new Union Station. Um, another possible location, the Delavan House, which was one of Railroad Jack's home bases in Albany, burned to the ground in 1894. So I know he wasn't there. And Pretty much soon after Railroad Jack died, a lot of the physical touchstones of his life in Albany also were gone. So it's hard to tell what happened, if he was ultimately taken home by a railroad worker, if he stayed with Vigors, if he was moved to another station, I just don't know. And it's kind of boggling, you know, to my mind of how one of the most famous dogs in the country goes missing. And I don't even know if I've been able to convey how well known Jack was. Um, I mean, he wasn't obviously the biggest celebrity of the day, but he had reached a point where his fame extended beyond the networks of railroad men. Um, the public knew about Jack. The public gave him gifts and would come to the stations to see him. So he was uh, a pretty well-known figure. And it's sort of vexing to me in that case that so quickly he was forgotten or displaced. And again, I want to be clear that I've searched anywhere that makes sense. So if anyone comes up with any other alternatives, please let me know. I've contacted all of the museums and historians in the Capital District that I can find, asking them questions about dog taxidermy they might have in their collections. And while everyone has been so lovely and helpful, unfortunately, we've come up with nothing. Um, I even for a while got really into researching 19th century pet cemeteries because I had heard the story of Bing, who was a dog, a World War II dog from Denison, Ohio, a world, excuse me, World War I dog from Denison, Ohio, who was first taxidermied. And then later there was a decision made to bury him and give him a grave site. So it was like, if that happened once, maybe it happened to Jack too. Um, and despite a really fascinating dive into the history of pet cemeteries, that also proved fruitless. 
in 2017, I turned to the internet to help. Um, I've been working on this project on and off for more than a decade. Um, and I figured that maybe we could go viral with a weird canine mystery, but I was wrong. The project didn't go viral. I did gather a modest following of people who really were interested in Jack um, and who promised to continue to look for him in antique shops and places like that. I was interviewed for a story in the Albany Times Union in 2018, uh, and it was, I thought, a really nice uh, report about the, about the story and the search, um, but still it didn't actually end up in any leads. Um, I thought maybe this would kind of continue the momentum. I contacted other media outlets, but uh, my messages about 125 year old dog corpses were largely ignored, which I guess I can understand. So I still don't know what happened to Railroad Jack. I don't have a big surprise reveal tonight for you. I wish I did. Um, if I had to take a guess about what happened to him, I would imagine that he is pretty long gone, um, that with the way 19th century taxidermy sort of deteriorates over time without any intervention, um, with the possible insect infestations that they get, or just the ways that the chemicals they use degrade, my guess is that even if he survived into the 20th century as, as a piece of taxidermy, that at some point he became separated enough from his legacy that the just physical grossness of his body was something that someone threw out. So that's my chief guess, but I'm open to being pleasantly surprised. Um, there is one other mystery, which is the image that is on the screen here. This is an oil painting of Jack done during his lifetime that used to hang in the Farnham's restaurant in Albany through the 1960s. So much more recent than the 1890s. Um, finding that piece seems slightly more realistic, yet I have not been able to track that down either. Um, so if anybody has seen this painting, please let me know. So I'm gonna wrap up very quickly with a little discussion, like I promised, of why all of this matters. Why have I spent the better part of a decade tracking down the stories of Railroad Jack, Oni, and their other contemporaries? Because it wasn't just these two. I just don't have enough time to give you the full layout of the world of canine celebrity during this period. Um, but Jack really, during that time period, was in that top tier of fame. Um, but he wasn't the only, he wasn't even the first, he predates Oni, but there were other semi-famous dogs before this. Uh, but I still think that trained dogs in this case, um, Jack in particular, are some of the most interesting cases of the change in both celebrity culture and the ways that people um, interacted with animals during this period. Um, for example, the train riding dogs mobility, the fact that they could just get on a train and show up pretty much anywhere, allowed them to achieve a wider celebrity than pretty much had been seen before. It's also interesting that Jack and Oni became famous during this period because they were notably mutts in an era where purebred show dogs were becoming even more prized. They come up, um, I've done a lot of work on the origins of dog showing in this country, and it's really, the peak of it is really happening around the same time that they're famous. And Railroad Jack and Oni were both invited to multiple dog shows. So it's um, pretty remarkable, they're, the acceptance of them, particularly you have a dog like Jack, who was once described as being as homely as a bucket of tarred ropes. Uh, this is also a time when uh, views of animals were changing. Um, as my former graduate school advisor, Catherine Greer, wrote in her book, Pets in America, 
Uh, the late 19th century was a time where people started viewing animals as pets in a way that they hadn't before. Um, this is actually kind of where our modern notion of pet keeping and pets being an extension of your family grows out of this time. And most importantly, I think that the study of animal fame gives us a really unique window into the Gilded Age. I've joked that Railroad Jack and Oni were like canine Forrest Gumps. They were intertwined with almost every important movement of that era. And I didn't even really, it barely scratched the surface with Jack's biography. Um, but they were intertwined and used as symbols of the labor movement. They became synonymous with various strikes and different efforts that the baggage and railroad and mail employees did. They tell us about the rapidly expanding transportation and communication systems of the era. They met famous people and politicians. They straddled the line between high and low culture and between the upper and working classes in a way that most humans could not. They tell us about health and public services. They talk in a sense about masculinity and the changing roles of men about capitalism and consumer culture, about entertainment, and really pretty much any facet you can think of. And weirdly, researching these dogs has led me into corners of the Gilded Age that, more corners of the Gilded Age than any project I've taken on before. So I hope with all of that, I've convinced you slightly um, that this is somewhat important. And when this project is finished and this book is, is finally ready, um, that maybe you would check that out and see a little bit more. And maybe, who knows, I will have found Jack at that point. So I'm going to wrap up at this point um, with another illustration of Jack. Again, my information, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, not only if you have leads about Jack, but if you just want to know more or ask anything, uh, you can find me in these places. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hope that you heard everything. Um, so, okay, I'm just checking in on the comments. Um, Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I had a I had a moment where I couldn't see the chat through the whole thing. So I just had this fear that I was just talking into the ether and no one could hear me, except maybe the cat. Um, so I know uh, I think David is still having tech issues. So if anybody has oh, any questions, uh, Feel free to ask. You can turn on your video or whatever is easiest. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was that was really enjoyable. I uh, I'm sure your cat's jealous of all the dogs in your <laughs> in your research life. Yes, I have. Uh, I, I do have a dog as well. In in fairness, um, he's just outnumbered here, uh, mm -hmm. and I have done a little cat historical research, um, but I will say that the uh, anti-cat bias, particularly of the late 19th century, does make that a little more difficult. Uh, for example, cat shows don't become a thing until after dog shows become a thing. Um, and people recorded or, or viewed even cats in the household differently than dogs for a while. Uh, cats were more of uh, you know, they had a job to do there. Not that dogs didn't, uh, but cats became pets um, a little bit, a little bit kind of after dogs for a lot of people um, because they were the mousers uh, or the barn cats. Um, so it's not impossible to do cat research. Uh, it's a little, little harder in this era. Well, I hope you uh, finally get to the bottom of what happened to Jack, It'd be interesting to know, or even that painting. That's, yeah, I, I would agree. You'd think that painting could be found, but you know, when hotels are shut down, I'm guessing it's everything just, just goes out the door. Yeah, I mean, my, I, I do remain hopeful that ultimately the, the right person will be like, wait, I think I, I think I saw that, <laughs> uh, but again, <laughs> 
if you don't know, it's just sort of a nondescript painting of a of a terrier sure. sitting there. So mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a in a way a little bit of a crapshoot of getting like the right message to the right person. I know that. someone. Yeah, I know someone named Vigors is is what's the spelling of the name? V I G A R S, or is it two uh, G's? It might be two G's. Yeah. I'm checking my notes. I can't turn my own pages here. V I G A R S. Yeah, no, it's not the same spelling. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I I have these complex uh genealogy trees that I've I create for for that family, and then there's another family that is very instrumental in Railroad Jack's story, the baggage master of the Union Depot um, during that period was a man named Matt McCarthy. Um, and he basically was Jack's primary caretaker. And I've tried to find descendants of him as well. And I have, it, it, it's, there are certain things you have to do as a historian. Sometimes it almost verge on feeling a little creepy, uh, like yeah. tracking family trees and genealogy of people that aren't related to you. Um, like I said, considering whether to just cold contact people with the weirdest questions uh, sure. yeah mm -hmm. so i mean it's it's kind of funny i mean if somebody contacted me and said you know my relative had done something weird like that i would love it but i <laughs> might not be <laughs> i might not be the most unbiased audience for that as someone who loves really weird historical stories <laughs> sure yeah i think it's worth trying I think it's great what you're doing. Thank you. Are there any any questions? Yeah. No pressure. I can let everybody go enjoy their evening. Yeah, I don't want to uh, to crowd uh, anyone else out from asking questions. I'm happy to continue if you have more. Well, uh, while people take a moment to think about that, our uh, program next week is going to be Camillus on the Erie Canal with Lisa Wiles. So I hope everyone can uh, tune in for that uh, next Thursday at the same time, same place. Yes. And uh, so uh, I didn't, didn't want to miss uh, giving her a, play, a plug. No, please. So, yeah. And I guess David never was able to. Uh, to get in, he got a new computer just today. And you would think the new computer would, you know, allow him to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but unfortunately, uh, I guess there's a few, uh, a few details he, they've got to figure out. So, well, I want to thank you very much. Yes, we thank really you. I... On behalf of David and Scoheri Crossing and the friends. No, I appreciate I appreciate the invitation. Thank you again and thank you to you all for coming. All right. We'll have a wonderful evening. Yes, too. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>